In the Times of London by uh, Ian, I believe that's how you say his name. Maybe I'm just pronouncing completely wrong. It's time we talked about the fall of Kiev. And in it, he's talking about how in July, so it's like a scenario, it's July and the Russian army is at the gates of Kiev. So that's not so far from now. That's only a few months. This was written uh, literally uh, in the hours before we spoke. Um, he's not going to leave. He needs ammunition. And so he basically laments on the fact that this is the scenario that the West, Washington, Paris, and Brussels are kind of mapping out and almost expecting that it's not a frozen conflict where there's no decisive advantage at all, that actually there is a collapse coming. And so I'm curious because I've seen this in The Economist as well, this description of the situation in regards to the weapons and the ammunition, all of this not going to Ukraine as fast or as much as it's needed, leading to a push by Russia this summer to essentially continue to make advances after the fall of Avdiivka. Maybe if we can get it like a battlefield uh, update in the context of some of these political um, alarm bells being sounded, as well as maybe some of these desperate moves from uh, some of these NATO member states themselves? Well, the, the desperate moves um, are the product of what is happening on the battlefields. And this this is, the, this is I think, the key thing to understand. I mean, this time last year, lots of optimism. The Ukrainians were going to launch their big offensive in the summer, summer of 2023. Uh, it was widely expected that even if the Russians were completely defeated, they would nonetheless be defeated to at least some degree. The Russians were supposed to be on the back foot. And um, it was supposed and hoped that by this time this year, the West would be dictating terms. What has happened is something completely different. The Ukrainian offensive failed utterly. In fact, and I, I, this is something I insist on saying. The Russians defeated it. Uh, uh, there is this unwillingness to accept the fact that the offensive didn't just fail of itself. It was actually defeated. The Russians stopped it. They stopped it in its tracks. The Ukrainians suffered enormous losses. The equipment that the West supplied to Ukraine was burnt up. And... After that happened, there was they were all comforting themselves. They were saying, well, look, there's going to be a stalemate now. Except there hasn't been a stalemate. And at some point over the last couple of weeks, probably at some point in January, finally the realisation dawned that the Russians are going to win this war, <laughs> that they are outproducing the West in artillery shells, in drones, in tanks, in every conceivable weapon system that's operating over Ukraine, that um, the F-16s are not going to make any difference on the battlefronts, and they're going to arrive too late, and they're going to be too few, and the Russians will shoot them down. There is also the realization that the air defense missiles that Ukraine has are running out, and that there aren't air defense missiles to replace them. And as I said, suddenly, sometime in January, the penny dropped. And I think what then crystallized matters further and made people realize this is going to happen a lot sooner than we feared, <laughs> than we thought it would, was that Avdeevka, the most heavily fortified position that the Ukrainians had on the entire front line, collapsed in the middle of February. So since then, you've had several weeks of people thrashing around looking for things to do sending tourist missiles to Ukraine. These are from Germany, you know, launching deep strikes on the Kerch Bridge deep inside Russia. That's going to scare Putin. That's going to force the Russians to come to terms. Um, others coming up with even more desperate plans, like um, Macron talking about sending French troops to Ukraine to fight the Russians. And I think what has then happened beyond that is that over the last two weeks or so, there's suddenly been an understanding in the West also that none of this is going to work. Um, Taurus missiles are not going to change anything. The F-16s are going to fail. Sending troops to Ukraine would be a disaster 
the Russians would destroy them and European publics would not accept it. And the United States is not prepared to go to World War III on behalf of Ukraine. So suddenly we have this widespread understanding right across Europe and indeed the United States as well, that Ukraine is going down and there is nothing that can be done to turn the situation around. And you're starting to get people like Ian Martin talking about these scenarios, you know, that Kiev is going to fall in July. There's a blame game out, blame the Republicans because they haven't authorized the $61 billion package. There's been articles about this in the Financial Times talking about the betrayal of Ukraine, things of that kind. So there's recriminations, there's attempts to shift the blame around. But none of this changes the fact that the West suddenly understands that all the things they hoped would happen, Russia collapsing economically, Russia being defeated on the battlefield, the Ukrainians fighting the Russians to a stalemate. None of this is going to happen. The Russian economy continues to grow. It continues to outproduce the West in weapons. The Russian army is getting bigger. It's continuing to advance. And everybody is spooked and panicked. And they don't know what to do. Yeah. Uh, Zelensky was in Sumy checking the, the fortifications out, taking a look at uh, Ukraine's uh, Sudovican line. And it uh, doesn't look very, very impressive. And uh, it looks like Russia's, Russia's going to, if they want to, they're going to move right through those uh, fortifications. And uh, you can tell from uh, the look on Zelensky's face that, uh, that he is defeated. He is absolutely defeated. But, um, you know, the, the whole uh, fall of Kiev, I, I suggest that everyone goes to, to the live stream that we did with uh, Jacques Sabad, and he, he explains exactly what, uh, what the Russian strategy is. And we've been talking about the Russian strategy as well for, for a long time. Since the beginning of the conflict, we talked about Klausovitz and how the Russians are, are going to fight this war. And uh, it, it still seems that the, the collective West is stuck on, uh, on territory. They still believe that Russia is, conter- is concerned about territory. And uh, during that live stream, uh, we talked about how Russia will take territory if they believe that it is going to help them in their overall objective, in their overall strategy. They will te- take territory. If it's not going to, to, uh, to help them to get to their overall objective, then they're not going to, to take territory. It, it, it's that simple. But, but the West is stuck on territorial gain they're stuck on these movie type of scenarios the fall of kiev the siege of kiev yeah. the Hesson counteroffensive to this day they still have not understood mm. the way russia is going about this conflict absolutely and, just to uh, quickly yeah. say i mean they, they they think about kiev you know like it's going to be the fall of berlin or the fall of saigon yeah. or something like that whereas that's not what the russians are up to they are working towards destroying the Ukrainian army. (laughs) That is their objective and has been from day one. And they've been doing that systematically right from the first day. And they're getting close now to the point where that situation has come with Ukraine running out of men, running out of ammunition, running out of machines to fight with, weapons to fight with. And um, it's likely that this process, once spring summer begins is going to is going to accelerate yeah it's it, demilitarization alexander demilitarization yeah, you know yeah. I, when putin would, would said that at the beginning of the of the smo everyone in the west was laughing what's demilitarization oh no <laughs> definitely what's, what's, what's yeah, what's, yeah. What's, yeah. <laughs> right <laughs> and, and, and they they constructed the siege of kiev narrative mm. they constructed it mm. Not, not, Putin did not say in, in the opening statement, our goal is to take Kiev in three days, or our goal is to take Odessa, or our goal is to, to go to Lviv. He never said any any of those things. Actually, in, in two years, they, they've never said that their goal is to get to this point. Medvedev, he's hinted at things, but I think that's right. Medvedev's bad cop type of role to keep everyone guessing. But But officially... Russia has never stated that they're going to get to this point or that point. Mm. All, all this Kiev stuff was th- this is this is the West. This is their narrative. Putin Putin said demilitarization and mm. he, he meant it. Demilitarization. 
I, I think the surprise is that no one thought that when Putin said demilitarization, mm. that he actually meant demilitarization of, of many countries in, in Europe mm. and in the West as well. I think yeah. that's the that's the NATO, surprising basically. part. All right. yeah. Yeah. Well, what, what's interesting about this too is that this whole siege of Kiev narrative feeds into what Vladimir Putin has recently objected to and what I think Russia has objected to from the very beginning, this kind of concocted Cold War-ish Russian expansionist project that uh, is constantly projected upon Russia. We've heard Lloyd Austin say it to the highest echelons of the uh, United States uh, uh, Biden White House. We've had you know, European leader, if European leaders say this, well, if Kiev falls, if Ukraine falls, then uh, Putin won't stop there. Russia will continue to expand throughout Europe. How much of that, though, is not just projection, but almost like a, a prediction almost of a broader conflict with NATO? Because as as I mentioned earlier, and you referenced Alexander, uh, uh, you know, Emmanuel Macron can't stop talking about sending French troops to fight Russia in Ukraine. Mm. Um, how much of this is like a prediction of a future that whether they want it or not, or, or maybe both, uh, they're kind of expecting at some point in the future. And Ukraine seemed to be a lot about this building up to this bigger conflict. Well, you made two very important points, and you're absolutely right about both of them. The first is, as somebody who studied European history, I can say definitely this narrative that the Russians are out to conquer the whole of Europe has been there since the early 18th century, since the time of Peter the Great, you know, that this vast uh, military empire in the east is, you know, that the Cossacks are, you know, intending to march westwards all the way to uh, the Rhine or the Seine, or the English Channel, or whatever it is. And, you know, this, this narrative of the Russians as being expansive, expansionist and aggressive, I mean, it dominated the whole of the 19th century. I mean, in, in Western, especially British, but also to great extent French uh, political discourse, the Russians were always going to advance all the way to the West, and this was their plan. And, of course, it dominated much of the 20th century as well. It is interspersed with other the other narrative that you also get about Russia, which is the diametric opposite about Russia, that it's weak, uh, that it's about to fall apart, that it's in decline. So either it's the one or it's the other. We never have anything, any real shade in between. We never talk about the country as a normal country. Now, the Russians have never shown any desire to advance westwards. I mean, they're a huge country itself. They're very, very familiar with their resources. You mentioned Putin. Putin yesterday spoke all about this. He compared the uh, military spending in the West with the military spending in Russia. He pointed out the United States spends 10 times more than on defense matters than Russia does. Then that doesn't even include the rest of NATO. The idea of the Russians trying to conquer Europe, as he said, is ridiculous. It is absurd. But of course, people are saying that. And you are absolutely right in your second point. Keeping up this narrative has a tendency to be a danger, runs the danger that it might become self-fulfilling. The one, the, the two times in modern European history when the Russians did advance, you know, to the Elbe, and then before that to the Seine, was after they themselves were invaded. Napoleon invaded Russia, got all the way to Moscow. The Russians drove him out, and in the war that followed, reached Paris. Hitler did the same. He invaded Russia. He almost got to Moscow, and the Russians, of course, drove him out, and then got all the way to Berlin. So I'm not saying that's how it's going to turn out this time. I don't think it will, actually. But the one way, the, the, the most likely way, the only way you could persuade the Russians to move west is if you attack them. And it's very alarming 
and very strange given the history and you know the record of what happens when you do that there are some people in the west who talk as if that's what we should do yeah self-fulfilling prophecy yeah. well macron macron tried he's still trying i guess to to provoke russia by sending by by floating the idea of sending the, the french troops into into ukraine but uh putin the other day in uh when he was at the uh, Tver region, he he actually said the same thing that Russia has no intention of going to to Europe. And he said it's it's ridiculous. It's it's not going to happen. But Putin also said that uh, that the Europeans they they need to continue to say that Russia is going to invade because at the end of the day, it's all about Europe creating this type of of, of Russia boogie bank so so they can centralize more power. That's that's what this is all about. Is <laughs> the European Union Brussels centralizing more power and that's what all of this rush is going to invade us and to keep people afraid keep the european european people afraid uh spent a lot of money on uh on the military on the mic got to get the money to the mic got to create factories got to get those mic stocks pumping up and uh and then as we have said in many videos it's it's war bonds it's euro bonds it's direct taxation it's eu armies and, and that EU army is not going to be pointed outwards. That EU army is going to be pointed inwards into the European Union. That EU army is going to be created, and they want to create that EU army. Macron is going crazy trying to create this EU army because they want that EU army to control the EU citizens so that next time the farmers want to protest, they can send the EU army to stop the farmers from protest. That's what all of this is about. But they need that enemy. They need that boogeyman, and there's no one better than uh, than Putin and and, uh, and Russia. It's perfect for them. Yeah, not a dissimilar dynamic, certainly in the United States, where rampant military spending generally also ends up in the hands of the national security state as well uh, to do exactly what you just said, uh, Alex. Uh, the same purposes. Um, so. Uh, maybe uh, to kick it back to you, Alexander, just briefly to close on this topic of NATO and the battlefield in Ukraine. Since this siege narrative is so ridiculous um, and, you know, July is not so far off, what can we really expect then from Russia from here on out? I know the results of the investigation might um, play into this. But let, let's say if we control for that, then what what is what is the next steps for Russia on the battlefield, given where they are situated right now? This is an excellent question, but it's always a very difficult one to answer because, of course, the Russian general staff who are running the war are a very secretive organization and they don't share they don't share their plans with us. Now, there is a there are strong indications that the Russians they've been talking about a buffer zone. In, uh, to, to guard their their northern borders, the Ukrainians have been undertaking incursions, or trying to undertake incursions into Russia proper through attacks on um, Kursk and Belgorod regions, and they continue to shell Russian cities like Belgorod specifically. So, the the Russians have been talking about setting up a buffer zone, and over the last week or so. The Russians have been conducting a bombing offensive around the city of Kharkov in northeastern Ukraine on a scale like nothing I have seen. I mean, in fact, the bombing and the missile strikes that the Russians are conducting across Ukraine at the moment is also on a scale like nothing I have seen. But the bombing of Kharkov is particularly intense. We're talking almost at American levels of bombing. And they it appears that they're directed principally at military units, but they've also destroyed power stations around Kharkov, which will make it more difficult to move to, to, to send troops there because uh, troops in this war are transferred by train, and the trains in this part of the world work on electric traction. So that perhaps points to an offensive towards Kharkov maybe in May or June, when the ground hardens and that the preparations are being made to do that. So that's one possibility. But the other area where the Russians have been fighting and where they've been achieving the big results 
over the last couple of weeks is somewhere completely different. And this, I think, might be, in fact, the more important battlefield. And that is central Donbass. Now, this is where the Ukrainians created their major fortified lines, where there were places like Avdevka, Marinka, these are small towns, Bakhmut, which you remember from last year, um, Pervomaisky, Krasnogorovka. Um, there's even a town there, by the way, a small town, which incredibly goes by the name of New York. Just saying. It is actually called <laughs> that. Oh, yeah. The actual name of it is New York. Mm. Strange. But anyway, these are all fortified towns. And what the Russians are doing is that they're, they're capturing them one by one. And the process appears to be accelerating because if you take the one, that opens the way to capturing the other. The number of these fortified towns is shrinking. The landscape is opening up. So I think that the major Russian attack, if it comes this summer, what the major Russian objective is this month, summer, is to take these remaining fortified towns in central Donbass. And once they do that, potentially they can advance eastwards towards the Dnieper River and they can start to uh, threaten traffic along the Dnieper River and the two big cities on the Dnieper, which are um, um, Zaporozhye and Dniepro, Dniepro, which is a little to the north of Zaporozhye. And frankly, if they do that, if they reach the Dnieper um, opposite these two cities, and if they capture them, and if Zaporozhye is on the east bank of the Dnieper, then I think they've won the war. Because I, I don't think I don't think they've just won the war. I think the war at that point will, will be in the end game. Because the universal consensus, even within Ukraine, is that Ukraine cannot continue the war without those two cities. They are two of the most important industrial cities in Ukraine. They control access to the Dnieper. They um, are the major staging grounds for the Ukrainian army. If the Ukrainians lose them, then it's game over. Yeah. Don't be surprised if, if we don't see a, a, a Zelensky collapse. No. no. You know? A lot, lot of people are, are are being fired or leaving or jumping ship. A lot of ambassadors in uh, in London. <laughs> Ambassador in Norway now with, yeah. uh, with right. Danilov. I mean, you know, it, it does feel like like a lot of you know I, these people. To me, I don't think they're being fired. Or they're they're definitely not being fired. It's it, if I had to take a guess, I would think that 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 a guy like Danilov and these guys are going to to Zelensky and they're saying, "Look, I want out." Yeah, I want out. I've, I've I've made all this cash. I I need to I need to get off uh, off this ship. So give me a post as ambassador. So I don't I don't know. Uh, I, I'm seeing things as as a lot of uh, a lot of people are, are are looking to to bolt, and and there have been reports that a lot of parliament members in yeah. uh, in the Rada are also trying to find a way to get out. Yeah. So you know something like that could happen as well. Yeah. I, I don't know. Maybe I'm just throwing it out there. Thank you for tuning in to my latest video. I appreciate all of your support. This channel, however, needs your help. I am seeking to make this channel more sustainable in the long term and upgrade necessary equipment to ensure that this work continues onward and makes progress to give you all of the geopolitical analysis that you all deserve. For that reason, I'm asking you to become a member of my Patreon community at patreon.com slash Danny Haifong. You can find that link in the video description or in the pinned comment below. For whatever amount you choose to give, just know you are supporting independent media that you can't find anywhere else. Thank you so much, and I look forward to the next video.